polling. I'm, I'm here to represent Congresswoman Yvette Clark. Uh, we are doing our Tax Tuesdays event as we had scheduled for this particular day. I have two gentlemen with us. The first person that will be presenting will be Mr. Womack from the IRS department, IRS agency. Our focus today will be small business, self-employed, the gig economy workers, and IRS resources during our IRS filing season. Please get out your pens and paper to have a great conversation with Mr. Brian Wozniak. And Mr. Wozniak, I'm going to give you control and the floor is now yours. Okay. Thank you, Orlando. And if you can, could you bring up that PowerPoint presentation we had sent and display that? A uh, couple of items we're picking up from a little bit of last week. We had talked about that we would continue our discussion on identity theft and tax-related identity theft and items of that nature. So some of the items we talked about and my fellow colleagues with the Taxpayer Advocate Service talked about were, number one, making sure that if you use a paid tax return professional that they need to sign the tax return. They, they need to sign as the paid return preparer and that you should always double check <clears throat> excuse me, double check the bank account information. Make sure it is your bank account, your routing number to ensure that your refund is delivered to your account. We talked a little bit about scams. Don't take the bait. Don't fall for any of these uh, phony telephone calls from people pretending to be the IRS. Don't fall for the emails, all those other items. So to kind of wrap up that whole discussion, what I'll say is identity theft is a nationwide issue and it goes beyond tax related identity theft crimes. What you're looking at here, and you can see the website at the top of this web page, is the identitytheft.gov web page. This is the federal website for all identity theft inquiries. It's not just IRS, it's everything. The Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, is the federal agency charged with identity theft, uh, protection of consumers, things of that nature. This is their website, identitytheft.gov. If you are a victim of identity theft, this is where you should go. You can click on the link in the center of the screen where it says get started and it will walk you through everything. However, I would also recommend that at the bottom of the screen, you can't see it here. I couldn't fit the full screenshot on. There's a link that says browse recovery steps and you can look through individual things. Now, if you go to this website, just to kind of capture some of the high points, it's going to talk about different elements of identity theft, such as what to do right away if you find out you're a victim, contacting the companies where you know the fraud occurred, placing a fraud alert on your credit reports, that you should file a uh, police report with your local police department and you should get a copy, a physical copy, and it might be printed out from the computer of that report. You should also file a report with the Federal Trade Commission. This site will direct you how to close new accounts opened up in your name and how to remove bogus charges from your accounts, how to correct your credit report. And a very important item is adding a credit freeze to your credit profile, credit freeze or security freeze is something all of us can do, whether or not you're a victim, and just lock down your credit report and it will protect you from having identity thieves commit crimes against you, like opening up fraudulent bank uh, visa cards, credit cards, fake bank accounts, all of that. And this site is so extensive. Again, it's your one-stop shop. It will talk about how to other, uh, work with resolving issues related to certain types of accounts. We often see identity theft with utility accounts, telephone accounts, government benefits is a big one, student loans, fake student loan applications, 
all those different items. It will talk about child or children's identity theft for children whose information has been stolen and how to protect those children. There's a section on medical identity theft. And the last thing I'll say about this is there is a section on tax-related identity theft. And it'll explain IRS-related identity theft. And if you're a victim of tax-related identity theft, you can even file the IRS identity theft affidavit through this website electronically. So that's it for identity theft. We're going to move on to the next slide and our next section I'm going to talk about the gig economy. Now, this uh, today's part of today's session is going to focus on small business, self-employed persons. My portion is specifically to the gig economy and your taxes, things you need to know. So first of all, let's talk about what the gig economy is, because or let's talk about the word gig in gig economy and what that stands for, because the word gig was originally coined by 1920s jazz musicians and it was slang for a short or temporary live musical performance that they would get paid for they get a gig then it expanded to mean getting paid for any short or temporary aspect of performing could be anything in the arts or entertainment and here we are now in the quote unquote, gig economy, it just means a job that lasts for a specified period of time that you get paid for. So what is gig work? Well, first of all, we're seeing a lot of recent activity uh, where gig work is any activity you do to earn income. We're seeing it now through apps or websites and digital platforms but you're probably more familiar with traditional gig work, like driving a car for booked rides or driving a car for deliveries. We've seen it with Uber, Lyft, et cetera. You're familiar with it. Gig work also includes renting out property or rooms. It can include running errands or performing tasks. Another big item we see is selling goods online. If you sell items or products online, that's gig work. If you provide or offer creative and professional services, whether in person or virtually, um, and really any temporary on-demand freelance work. Those are all examples of the gig economy. But more importantly, just like any other job, whether it's office job or whatever it is, any money earned through the gig economy is taxable. As a gig economy worker, it is your responsibility to keep track of the money you make and report it on your tax return. And you must file a tax return if you have net self-employment earnings of $400 or more from gig work. Even if it's a side job, a part-time job, or temporary assignment. So this means if you receive income from gig economy activity, it's generally taxable, even if you don't receive a W-2 or you don't get a 1099 or some other income statement. Now, that said, it may be taxable, but on the other hand, your business expenses may be deductible, and that depends on a lot of items. There are tax limits and other rules. A couple quick items before I wrap up. Uh, the U.S tax system is called a pay-as-you-go system. You pay your taxes as you go. If you earn a paycheck as a gig economy employee, your employer usually withholds tax from your pay to help cover the cost you owe. Now, if you're a gig economy worker who is not considered an employee, then you have to make up your taxes or pay them in other ways. And there's really two other ways you can do it. You could fill out and submit a new W-4 form to other jobs where you work as an employee and just have extra withholding taken out of your pay from those jobs. Or you can make quarterly estimated tax payments to help pay your taxes through the year, including the self-employment tax. But the it's IRS and the 
federal tax system is pay as you go. Technically, the tax is due when you earn it. It's not due at the following year when you file your tax return that year. Um, another key component of small business, self-employed, and gig economy workers is to keep good records. The IRS requires you to keep adequate proof of your income and expenses. Now, some companies will track this information for you and they'll include it when they send you a W-2 or a 1099 miscellaneous or a 1099-K perhaps at the end of the year. But even if they don't send you a statement, you're still required and it's very important that you keep track of all your income and expenses to report it on your tax return. And finally, check your tax payments. You should, of course, make sure that you're paying in enough. And the IRS.gov website has something called an IRS withholding estimator. You can use it to help you see if you should make additional payments because you really want to avoid a large unexpected tax bill at the end of the year, plus any additional penalties or interest that might be charged on it. Um, and it's really important if you have multiple jobs and or if you have to pay self-employment tax. So if we could just take this screen that we're looking at here is a center landing point gig economy tax center. If you go to the next web, uh, excuse me, the next screenshot, we'll see that this is IRS publication 5369, 5369, has a bunch of information on gig economy workers, and this applies to a lot of small businesses and self-employed folks as well. The next slide has a list of resources, the websites, um, if we could go to that, there we go. And you can see at the top, I've included the link for the Gig Economy Resource Center. Then the next few items, you can see the verbiage where I say go to irs.gov or where it states, go to irs.gov and search. And I put the key search phrases in quotations. You can go to publication 5369. You can search manage taxes for your gig work. And then you can see there's IRS tax tips there as well. Now, in closing, I kind of explain what gig work is, um, that gig economy income is taxable, that you have to file a tax return and report that income, and that you need to pay your taxes as you go throughout the year. And finally, keep good records. The last slide that I included there is if you're interested in federal jobs, including the IRS, Take a look at this slide. It's for usajobs.gov. Simply go there. You can search a location in the upper right and begin your search to begin a new federal government career. Orlando, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, Brian, thank you so much. That was a very informative conversation for small business gig workers and self-employed. You know, I think it's a great opportunity that we have you on. Please stay on. We're going to need to. We're going to need to. You guys are getting a dinner at this thing. Move this one other person, Brian. We're gonna. We're going to. We want you to stay on because we're going to have some questions regarding small business, and the gig workers. I have a few questions that will be coming up. Now, the next person that will be gracing our stage is Mr. Adjiti from the Tax Advocacy Service. Mr. Adjiti, we just need you to fix your camera so that we could see your face before we bring you on live. And so let me explain. You got to make it a little bit higher. So a little bit about the Tax Advocacy Service. In, my, in the Office for Congresswoman Yvette Clark, what we do is that we advocate with the tax advocacy services for our constituents when they have issues with getting refunds and getting their filings done. Mr. Avity is one of our key uh, collaborators on the tax advocacy side to make sure that our refunds for our constituents are done in an expeditious manner. Mr. Avity will be talking about ways that his office impacts small business and the gig workers in regards to filing, refunds, et cetera, any issues. Mr. Advocacy, I'm going to bring you back on. There you go. 
And Mr. Advocacy, your the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ross. Uh, my name is George JT. I'm the local taxpayer advocate for the Brooklyn office. Um, taxpayer advocate is located nationwide. We are in every state. Even though we work by jurisdiction, any offices that you go, you'll be direct. Um, your cases will be taken, and we will work within our systems to transfer cases to where it needs to be worked. Uh, we are. Uh, we work in collaboration with the congressional office to ensure that any issues that you have with internal revenue service is resolved in a expedient way as possible. Now, taxpayer market mission is to assist taxpayers that are having issues with internal revenue service and to make sure that we help you resolve those issues. Um, the since today is uh, a small business day. I want to remind a small business is self-employed. I also want to remind the um, individuals that have joined us today that today is a tax day, meaning you have to file your taxes by 11.59 p.m. today. That is when you'll be in compliance with the um, filing. You don't want to get charged with a late filing. And if you are not able to file today, you can also file an extension. That will give you six months extension all the way to October 15th. So I urge everyone, if you have not filed your taxes, try to do so by 11.59 p.m. today. Once they hit 12 a.m., it is on the 19th, and then you will be late. You want to make sure that you take advantage of it, and if you cannot file, by all means, file extension. Extension is the time that you needed to file your taxes, not to pay. So if you owe taxes and you don't pay today, then you are subject to or you will be subject to uh late payment penalties and if you don't file and you don't file extension to then you'll be subject to failure to file uh, penalty you don't want that to happen to you so let me jump into small business areas now as a small uh, business one of our main aim is to reach out to you to explain to you some of the things that you need to do to help you that way you stay in clear with internal revenue service. One of them that my colleague has already mentioned is proper record keeping. It is really, really important for you to keep proper records because as a small business owner, you're dealing with expenses. You're going to deal with your revenue that comes in and that is what is going to report it to IRS. However, you also will have expenses to deduct because it costs money to make money. So everything that you do, it costs you some money to generate that revenue. So in order for you to be able to properly um, deduct or claim your expenses, you want to make sure you have good record keeping. Um, the burden of proof is on you as a taxpayer. You can say you make one million, and IRS is going to accept that. However, when you start taking your deductions out, that's when it gets dicey because they want to know... Um, what caused these expenses and so if you're subject to um audit your documentation become very very important another thing is employment taxes if you have employees you know and you don't have to be a big company like you know this big giants like a walmart best buy on those things to have employees you can have a small business and have maybe one or two people that is working for you that are considered employees you want to make sure that you file your employment taxes which is the 941 um it could be 941 it could be 944 but 944 is filed on a yearly basis because your payroll taxes is usually around 2500 or less but anything above that you are required to file quarterly basis so you have to file your 941 and if you have a cpa that is working with you or an accountant that is working with you they will know that they have to file the 941s on quarterly basis in instances when you file your 941 that you owe taxes more than 2500 then you'll be required to do FTD. That is the federal tax deposit. And so you want to make sure you do those as well. That is uh, one of the things that is important. And then also who is classified as employee or independent contractor and also how you select a, a tax professional. You know, IRS website is equipped with you selecting somebody who can who is a reputable person or credible person that can help file your taxes for you. You can use those same people. Most of the uh, tax uh, professionals, 
that do individuals also do businesses. So if you are a sole proprietor, that means you have not been incorporated, then you'll be required to file your regular 1040 and also schedule C or F. Now, if you're self-employed, uh, or for your self-employment taxes, you file schedule SE. For estimated tax, that is 1040 ES. And then I mentioned earlier, the employment tax, this is from 940, 941, 944, or 943. You want to make sure you stay on top of this. If you're a partnership, your annual, you have an annual return, which is the 1065. 1065 is just a reporting only. You don't pay taxes on that because the partners won't pay their own taxes when you give them the schedule. So, but the actual 1065 is just for information purposes to show how much the partnership made and how much will be going to each partner. So you want to pay attention to that. If you are S Corp, if you're a corporation, you file 1120 and 1120 is usually due on April the 15th. So if you are a calendar year, then April 15th, which has passed. If you are a physical year, then it's four and a half months from the from the time of your calendar year. Now you can also elect to be tasked as an S Corp. Now, if you are S Corp, it is due on March 15th, which has passed already. So it is my hope that all these due dates, whoever is working with you as a business owner or as a small business owner, whether you have employed an accountant to work with you or not, they will stay on top of this filing requirements and they do that for you we want to make sure that you don't pay unnecessary penalties that is going to take money away from your pocket now if you do have employees and you don't file your 941s or you file them and you don't pay IRS have what we call trust fund assessment the trust fund assessment is basically the taxes that you withheld from your employees paycheck and then 50% of FICA. FICA is Social Security and Medicare. Half of it is something that the employees contribute to it. And then the pay payroll or pay um, the taxes you will have from the employees paycheck is also employees' money. It's not yours. So that is something that the IRS will make sure that you'll do a trust fund and assess it on the owner or whoever is responsible and willful and they assess this on you as a person under your social security number. So you want to make sure that you avoid all of this by uh, paying those employment taxes on time, doing your deposit if you have to do them on time, because at the end of the day, the burden of proof is on you. And once you don't keep records, it will be hard for you to prove your cases when you get to exam. So. That is a few things that I'll be sharing with you this morning. And if you have any other question, my office telephone number is 718-834-2200. Our fax number is 855-818-4818. So if you want to reach us either through fax or telephone if you have any issues that you think we can be of any assistance to you we are more than welcome to help you in that regard we want to make sure that you understand the law you understand your filing requirements and then you take care of them once again today is tax day ensure that you take care of your personal taxes to include if you're so proprietor that you file schedule c you include that in there as well and you report accurately because under reporting has its own penalty as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Adjati. Thank you, Mr. Adjati. So please stay on. That was very vital information. I'm going to be going through a series of questions. We did get a question from YouTube. So Mr. Brian Wozniak, I'm going to add you to the stream as well. So basically, this is the question that just came through from, from YouTube um, from Ms. Uh, uh, Shani Freeman. The person communicated, I tried to file for extension, but the IRS rejected it. Without making clear what the error was, how do I go about going to rectify this situation? I'm going to direct the question first to Mr. Brian Wozniak, 
And Mr. Adjati, you know how that works for the advocacy program and your role. First, Mr. Brian Wozniak. Okay, a couple items on extensions. And uh, Mr. Adjati did explain all the due date requirements. Here we are, it is tax day. You do have until 11.59 tonight. On extensions, number one, if for any reason you can't submit your tax return by the deadline at close of business today, please file an extension. The extension form is 4868. Now, I want to clarify because the extension of time to file is not an extension of time to pay. You still have a requirement to pay the estimated amount owed. But if you file the extension, it will give you an automatic extension of time until October 15th. Regarding the caller's question or the question that was posted on Facebook, it sounds like when they state that they submitted the extension, it sounds as if they tried to file the extension electronically, which is what we prefer. You can file extensions electronically rather than on paper and mailing it to a snail mail. When you file a form, any uh, tax return or an extension electronically, there is usually something, if we don't accept it, we usually provide what is called a reject code explaining what information is missing that we need in order to accept it. What I would recommend in this case is you could try to file the form again by going to the IRS website, irs.gov, type the words free file. And by the way, you can file the extension electronically using it there. So you can go to free file and you can also prepare and file your tax return there if your income is $73,000 or less. But go to irs.gov, type free file and try to file the extension electronically there. If you cannot get the extension filed electronically, get the form 4868, print it out, complete it and mail it and get it postmarked today. Needs to be postmarked by close of business today. That's how to get your extension in. Great, great. So they said that they did file that form and yes, they did electronically. But remember we spoke about the app that they can also use to track their refund and all their filings. Does that, does that app cover for small business and a gig worker? There is something, it's called the IRS to go app, which many people have on their phone. And there's a, a whole series of uh, information available on the app, uh, including for different small business self-employed, there's ways to interact with the IRS. They, I would have to check, but I don't believe you can use the app to verify that an extension was received. When you file the extension electronically, you should get some type of acknowledgement back that it's been accepted. And if you don't, like I said, just make sure you file a paper form and get a postmark today. So it's still considered timely. George, so, I, yeah. If, if so I, I would like Mr. G T to, 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 to actually answer it from the side of the tax advocacy. If they're having an issue, how does that work with our office and with you? Okay, so it's pretty much the same as um, Brian explained, you ha if you can go through electronically, there may be a reason, and I'm not sure why she's not seeing the reason, but the best option at this point in time to do the paper form and then get a postmark today. I will also suggest that sending something like a um, certified return or something that you can track it and keep record of that. So if you file somewhere in October 15 or you file before then, and I stated that, oh, you are late and they want to charge you a, a late filing fee, <coughs> excuse me, then the postmark and the certified return receipt can be used as your supporting document showing that you send it on time. At that point in time, we will be able to assist you to fight the case that you file it on time. But we would need that document or that record showing that you file it on time. So certified return may be a good thing to have. Now, for businesses, if you have to file an extension, the form is 7004. I know my colleague mentioned the individual 148. 
but for business, it's, it's form 7004. Great, great. So the next question that came in is from Mr. Vladimir Sterling from um, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. He had a question. He said, how far back can we amend an income tax filing? And in terms of the of a small business, a gig worker, or someone of, that is self-employed? the uh, Mr. Wozniak, can you answer that question? There's quite a bit there because uh, what you're talking about really relates to the statute of limitations, especially regarding refunds. And it's generally three years from the due date of the return, generally three years from the original due date of the tax return itself. So just for example, uh, let's say you're a self-employed person, you file Schedule C as a sole proprietor which that income is included on your 1040 return. So everyone's preparing their 1040 series return now, which is due today, April 18th. So generally the statute on how far you can go back, you would have three years from April 18th moving forward. So right now, April 15th, the statute just expired. You still have a three-year window going back. For businesses, it can be a little bit different, especially when you look at something like payroll tax. That may be four years. Uh, it, it can be up to four years back to correct previously filed returns. And George also brought up that there are different due dates for different types of tax returns. I mentioned small business, self-employed, sole proprietors. That's on your 1040 return. When you're dealing with partnerships and S-Corps, their due date is generally March 15th of each year or the year following the close of business. Some are on not calendar years. They work on fiscal years. So it really depends on the specific facts and circumstances. Generally, though, three years from the original due date or two years from the time you pay the tax, if you pay late, it may be a little bit longer than the standard three-year rule. Great, great. We're getting a lot of questions. I'm, I'm really happy about this. Um, we're going to go back to Ms. Shani Freeman, and I'm going to share her question. So in the office that I serve for Congresswoman Yvette Clark, we have issues with people actually accessing the files in the full, you know, different applications. What would you recommend for someone that's having a problem printing out the their forms? What what would you recommend that they do? Because we're moving more to an uh, an AI platform, a more technology platform, a more email driven platform, electronic platform. Some of our constituents really are not on those levels, but prefer to print it out in paper. What do you recommend they do? We still have, um, when you go to irs.gov, and in this case, for example, the extension form for individuals, the form 4868, we offer almost all of those forms in a PDF format, in Adobe Acrobat PDF format. And Adobe is a free program. You can get it downloaded. So Anyone who has internet access, web access, should be able to go to irs.gov, download and save that file, that PDF file, and print the form out. Now, if they can't do that, there are other programs. And again, I realize we're here April 18th, but we have uh, various programs, with, especially with libraries, where you can go, many libraries will stock forms available there um, where you can pick them up live in person. You can go to IRS offices or multiple offices in the New York metropolitan area. And in the future, again, excluding the deadline, you can call 1-800-TAX-FORM, F-O-R-M, and order any forms you need and we'll mail them to you within five to 10 days. Now, obviously, we're here at the deadline, so that may not work. But moving forward, 1-800-TAX-FORM. So you, there's multiple options always uh, to get them. I mentioned the libraries. It goes with the banks, post offices, and libraries program. There are certain entities that keep those in stock. But the walk-in offices at the IRS, ordering it. 
and then you should be able to print online if assuming you can your computer's up to speed and can save an adobe file thank you mr agity from the from the lens of working with the tax advocacy service what um, services would would you recommend um i communicate to a lot of our constituents the libraries. I agree with you, um, Mr. Wozniak. I always try to locate a local library that's close to our constituent where they can go in and actually get free services. Mr. Adjati, what would you would you like to chime in on that? Become one of the areas that we also mentioned. And tax advocate, for instance, was really, really um, tough on IRS when IRS started moving some of the, those of those forms to online. I don't know if you remember this, but publication 17, um, nowadays it's not even in print form anymore. Uh, we mentioned that to Iris in, in several um, conversations that yes, as we are moving towards online, there are people that will still like paper, you know, paper products. And so Iris maintained that for the taxpayers. And my colleague gave the telephone number, the 1-800 number, so as if you need any form and you are not able to load it on or download it on the um, internet or the IRS website, you can call that number and they will mail it to you. Um, it's just that you have to do it a little earlier so you can receive it on time to do what you have to do before any deadline comes. But library has been one area that we also um, tell people they can take advantage of it. There are other small, small, um, uh, what do you call it? organizations that have individuals in different areas that may also have those services around you know so we can also tell them hey if you have any such organizations around that deals with helping individuals with any type of um paper, paper documentations or those um, companies that deal with um, free financial literacy educations and things like that sometimes they can also be helpful in terms of uh been able to print it from their sites. So that's one area that we to mention. And Orlando, if I could just chime in real quick, we delivered an event last week and that is still posted on Congresswoman Clark's Facebook site. So you can go back and visit and revisit these. But we talked extensively that there is the volunteer income tax assistance program. If your income is $63,000 or less, we talked about tax counseling for the elderly. That's out there. We have uh, programs in partnership with AARP to offer free tax help. Uh, you can use free file on irs.gov if your income is $73,000 or less. There's a choosing a tax return professional tool there. And we have these forms for the most part in at least seven languages. There's all types of multilingual um, resources there. IRS.gov has web pages and seven other languages, most common web pages. And we have basic tax information in up to 20 languages. And they can file a schedule LEP, limited English proficiency, to get more of a different language. So a lot of resources out there, Orlando. And please check out last week's uh, broadcast on Representative Clark's Facebook page. So now I want to move the conversation to communication between the constituent through the taxpayer and directly to the IRS and to T TAS. I'm pretty sure some people don't even know about the tax advocacy service or um, the arm of the IRS. Can you speak a little bit more, Mr. Wozniak, about how the IRS is improving the communication from constituents if they have an issue? I know there's 800 numbers that they can go to but there were some different things that we talked about before, but if for a small business person, how would they communicate? How is that being improved? Maybe if you can mention maybe three changes that have happened for the IRS. Well, there's quite a bit always uh, in change. Mr. Wozniak, are you still with us? Mr. Adjazi, could you could you take that that message? Okay. So the the thing is, uh, we are all aware of the delays within the IRS areas, and that was uh, due to lack of um, um, availability of staff. 
COVID-19 was one of them. However, uh, Congress has been very, very kind enough with internal revenue service by approving the huge budget so IRS can do hiring. As we mentioned, there's a lot of hiring going on right now to beef up the staffing level so that um, we'll have staffs available to um, pick up calls and address uh, taxpayers or constituent concerns. Now, as we speak right now, if you go to USA.gov, uh, uh, there is USAjobs.gov. There's a lot of hiring. Every department is doing a lot of hiring right now to ensure that we have the uh, available staff. Now, prior to that, that was the big issue because you have a lot of people retiring, people living in service, and we were not able to hire due to funding. So as we speak now, because of the hiring that is going on, we are anticipating that once these people get on board and these people are fully trained, there will be more staff available to answer questions and answer calls. Now, those who cannot get through internal revenue services directly, taxpayer advocate service has been one area so that they can come and we can provide the services that they need, especially when they have issues that they want to resolve and they cannot resolve an internal revenue service. So taxpayer advocate has been one of the areas they can come for us to assist them. They can come to us directly or through the congressional office. Whichever way they choose to come, we will be there to assist them. And like I mentioned, our direct line is 718-834-2200. That is our intake line. Or that is uh, our fax line is 855-818-4818. The form to complete to come to taxpayer advocate is from 911. You go to rs.gov and key in, in the search engine from 911. You'll be able to get the form. You complete it. You list the issues that you want to fix, you want to resolve, that IRS is not helping you. And you fax it to us. For us, your case will be assigned to an individual case advocate that will be working with you. You will have his or her telephone number. So if you have any questions or you have additional documentation to provide, you can call the individual directly. It's not like you call the IRS and you're waiting on the line hoping somebody come on in. But until that issue is fully solved with the recent hiring, task your advocate is available. Your case will be assigned to an individual. You can call him. They will schedule calls with you. Anytime they talk to you, they give you a, a callback date, normally within 30 days or 15 days, depending on the issue that you're having, how long it takes to resolve. So that, that has been one of the ways to um, improve the communication with IRS and task advocate be in the middle of that to assist the task as well. Great, great, great. So, um, Mr. Wozniak, we're going to move on to the next question from Mr. Kelly Pierre. Um, he, he has a question. It says, is the deadline to file for taxes with LLCs different from an S corp? Can you speak to that? Just briefly, I'll state that, um, there's, the first item you need to understand that is an LLC, a limited liability company, is not a federally recognized designation. Limited liability company is something your business entity applies through at the state level to get limited liability protection under state law. LLCs at the federal level need to still be designated as either an S corporation, a C corporation, a self-employed sole proprietor. There's something called a disregarded ent entity, but generally the LLC is a designation at the state level. At the federal level, you're either gonna be a partnership, S corp, C corp, or one of these other uh, miscellaneous items. So at the federal level, you'd be going by, uh, if you are an S corp, you'll be going by the, and S Corp stands for subchapter S Corporation. You would be going by those guidelines, and then your due date would depend on whether you are a calendar year or fiscal year filer. If you file and report your income and expenses on a calendar year, January 1st through December 31st, then generally your S Corp tax return would be due March 15th of the following year. If you're on a fiscal year, it just depends when your year ends, which month. So facts and circumstances of each case. 
Great. So one more question just came through. What is the maximum amount of years you can go without filing a personal taxes? I know we have some personal people on and what we want to service everyone because of the pandemic. It has been three to four years since filing my personal taxes. Now, I want to answer that question on a personal level and now on a small business level. So we know that there are different deadlines for different organizations or different industries. Let's talk about that. I'm going to send it first to Mr. Agiti and then Mr. Wozniak. Okay, thank you very much for that question. So the thing is, the best thing is to file your taxes every year. However, if you are not able to file the taxes every year, you want to file it as soon as you can because of the statute of limitation that uh, my colleague explained earlier because you have three years to file to get a refund if you're gonna get a refund. Now, if that three years expired or the statute of limitation expired, you can still file your return, but if you are due a refund, you're not gonna get a refund because that refund is gonna to move to SS collection. So you pretty much give money away to the government that you should be getting that money. So that is the thing. Now, if you are filing for payment that you receive, I mean, payment that you made, then that's the two years. So you want to file it so you don't lose money. That is the bottom line. Because once the statute of limitation expired, you can still file the return. I was just going to take it. But if you do a refund, you're not going to get it. And that is what that that is the law. So in this situation, it's, a tax advocate really cannot do much about it. Now, if there's any circumstances that created that, then we'll be able to look at it and say, okay, this person was super, super ill, hospitalized, bedridden, can't do nothing, don't have her, his or her documentation to file the taxes, and nobody else can do that for him or her. And so for that reason, that may have caused the issue. That may be a reasonable cause to fight with or, or to, to work with. But as to if it's going to be successful, it's case-by-case -case basis. And so the most important thing, because you don't want to lose money, you want to file it every year. But if you don't, for whatever reason, make sure that the three year you are within that three year range, so that you don't lose your money. Mr. Wozniak, can you can you speak to that from the IRS? I agree with everything George said. Uh, number one, if you're due a refund, you certainly don't want to lose access to that refund. And I'll just build a little bit more upon it: the not filing of tax returns. What you have to look at is, number one, were you required to file a tax return? And that's based on your income and the types of income you have and various other items. But if you're required to file a tax return, you have to file. And on top of that, if you owe money, and by the way, that threshold for filing and return, we're talking about small businesses. If you're a self-employed sole proprietor, and you have $400 or more of income, you're required to file a tax return. And what we run into is people who don't file on time, the penalty for failing to file is much higher than the penalty for failing to pay. If you don't file, you will be charged 5% per month of the balance due for the first five months. So right away in five months, you could owe 25% more. And that doesn't include the late payment penalty or interest. That's just not for filing it. So it's two sides. One, are you required to file a tax return? Then you have to get it in. Number two, you don't want to lose a refund. And if you owe money, you don't want those penalties and interest to accrue. It's better to file even if you can't afford to pay just because the penalties are much lower. So Perfect. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears. Um, um, I have four, four common tax errors that people have been talking about, and I wanted to bring that to everyone's attention for a small business. Say I'm a small business, what are the pitfalls? What are the four top pitfalls that you think that I'm gonna give you the question, give you the issues that that I've located? And one of the first things, four issues as, an, as a small business, as a gig worker, as a self-employed, underpaying yeah. estimated taxes. How do they, this is considered to be an issue. Um, in a short, you know, abbreviated way, can you give a solution about that or how to mitigate underpaying your estimated taxes, starting with Mr. Brian Wozniak? 
Uh, estimated taxes. So again, earlier I talked about the U.S. tax system is pay as you go. So technically, when you earn the money, that's when the tax is supposed to be paid in. Wage earners, employees, when they earn it, they have the money withheld from their check every time they're paid. But self-employed people, they may not have the money withheld. So they generally send in what are called quarterly estimated payments. There's vouchers you can use, 1040 ES, estimated tax. You can pay online. We have multiple ways to pay online. But you pay in every few months. You estimate how much you made and pay in. By the way, you can pay in as often as you like. You could pay in every time you receive a check. But the minimum is if you have an estimated tax payment requirement, you got to send those in quarterly. So don't make that mistake. And that ties into the other part of keeping very good records. If you keep records, kind of know what your income or expenses are, you should be able to navigate that pretty well. George, I don't know if you want have anything to add on to that. Uh, yes. Um, what I would add on to it is, and if you're a business, even with individuals, you can register with EFTPS. So you can also do the deposit through there. You want to do this uh, federal tax deposit quarter basis. That way, by the time you file your actual return, you have already paid enough in to cover your return. If the business, you estimate that you're not going to have any growth, then look at how much you pay last year. That can be a base ground for you to estimate how much you should be paying. But like uh, Mr. Wozniak mentioned, it's pay as you go. So once you end the income, you can estimate it from that point. You can use EFTPS to pay. And if you have a business or a small business, you want to make sure you register with EFTPS because that is one of the ways to pay your taxes or the, the deposit so that they will be in before. Because if you don't pay deposits, you get charged for penalty for fellow to pay deposit. So you want to stay ahead of that and to ensure that you put enough in to cover what is going to happen in the, when you file your taxes. And if you overpay, you're going to get the difference back. So it's not like the money because you overpaid, so you lost the, the difference. You're going to get it back to you or you can even elect for that to go to the following year tax return. So you have options there. The If you do it that way, it helps you to avoid that balloon payment at the end of the year, which you may not have, and also help you to save on penalties for FTD penalty or estimated payment penalty if you are required and you fail to do so. And Orlando, just to build on what George said there, very important EFTPS, the Electronic Federal Tax Payment System. One final comment just came into my mind. If you're a small business, self-employed person, and you have employees, and George was talking about the deposits, make sure you get your payroll right as far as your employees are concerned. Uh, when you assume many more responsibilities by taking on employees and you do have deposit requirements, Make sure you get that right, and we tend to frown much more on that if you don't at least take care of that in your employees. So be careful with your payroll requirements if you have employees. So through the research, I'm glad that you brought that up. Through the research, they said depositing employee taxes is an issue. That's a hurdle. And if you pay your stuff not in balloon payments but pay them immediately as you go, you probably would avert that issue. So um, there's one, got two more questions, and then we're going to wrap up with last question with last statements. The the one one hurdle that I'm seeing from my research from the IRS, they said um, one of the hurdles that businesses have to go through when paying their taxes is not separating business from a personal expense. Can you speak to that, Mr. Adjuty, and then Mr. Brian Wolsey? Can you repeat the question? I didn't get it right. So the question is one of the one of the one of the four hurdles that small businesses have to go through, or a gig worker or a self-employed, is that they they don't effectively separate their business expenses from their personal expenses, and then when they have to pay their taxes, it's a problem. So can you? I guess can you speak to that, Mr. Adjuty? Yes. Okay. So. That is the actual process of that is called commingling, right? You want to separate your business from your personal expenses. And you can do so by good record keeping. You will know which one is the personal expenses and which one is business expenses. 
Another thing you can do is you can create a log for yourself and you can list what is business and what is personal because actually commingling is not something that is allowed. So you put yourself in a bad situation when you are not able to separate the two. It is imperative to be able to have a system in place that work well for you so you can separate them. If you don't separate them, then you're going to have issue of either under-reporting or over-reporting. And that is, you know, um, over-reporting or over-reporting what you have actually made is going to hurt you too because then you're going to end up paying more taxes than you should have. And under-reporting will also create some penalties for you. So as a business owner, you know what your expenses are. So have a way to separate them. One best way to do is, is record keeping. You have your own records. You know, this is my business expense. This is my um, uh, personal. Also, have two different bank accounts. Have a business bank account and then personal bank account. If you put them together, it is hard because so many things is happening from January to December. And so if you don't have that system in place, by the time December comes, to wrap up the year, if you're doing a calendar year, or if you're doing a fiscal year, whatever the end of fiscal year is for you, now it is time for you to start thinking back and say, okay, which was personal and which was business. Sometimes it can be very difficult to do. And so right from the beginning, separate them. If possible, have a two separate bank account. So everything that has to do with your business is going to one location. Everything that has to do with your personal is going to one location. Your records, you keep them also separate to know that this is what is a business record and this is what is a personal record for me. That is one of the best ways to ensure that you don't engage yourself in commingling. Great. Mr. Wozniak? I think George hit the nail on the head. He pretty much covered everything. Don't commingle. Keep separate bank accounts. You can go to irs.gov. We have a bunch of references, uh, a publication on record keeping not mixing accounts, we have tax tips, et cetera, but George, spot on. Great. So we're going to close out because we're going to have another um, uh, session for faith-based, for nonprofits. We don't want to take up too much of your time. I wanted to thank everyone on the call. I'm going to give the floor over to Mr. Adjati, then to Mr. Brian to give your last remarks. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, last remarks, make sure you file by the end of today. Today is a tax day, remember, and file electronically if all possible, because that is the best way to ensure that you're going to get your refund on time. And if you are not able to file today, ensure that you file extension so you can have time to file it later on down the road. Just make sure that you file within the statute of limitations so if you do a refund, you can get your money and file even if you cannot pay because failure to pay will also create uh failure to file will also create a penalty for you and so file if you cannot pay go ahead and file you can get into installment agreement you can get into oic if you do qualify and even to some extent you can get into cnc if your financial condition shows that which is currently not collectible if your financial condition supports that so there's a lot of programs out there Last but not the least, if you have issues and you cannot resolve with the IRS yourself, reach out to Taxpayer Advocate Service and we will help you resolve that issue. Thank you very much. And I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Mr. Adjati. So the next person that we'll be bringing back to the stage is Mr. Brian Wozniak. Mr. Brian Rosiak, we appreciate all the work that you've done so far. We look forward for our last session, which will be next week. Mr. Wozniak, the floor is now yours. I Just to reiterate everything that George said, today is the tax deadline, so please make sure you file um, by 11.59 tonight at the very latest if you're filing, filing electronically. It's always better to interact with us electronically if you cannot get your individual income tax return into us today, file an extension. And for the small business and self-employed folks out there, including the gig economy workers, know your responsibilities. There is a lot of help and a lot of resources out there in addition to the IRS. And as far as the IRS is concerned, you have irs.gov, 
We have all types of resources uh, online for small businesses and self-employed people, for gig workers. We have a business and specialty help tax line. I was just looking for that. I believe the number is 1-800-829-4933. Again, you can look that up on irs.gov. Our telephone systems are much more accessible this year. We had some issues during the pandemic, but there's a lot of online help. And outside that, you might find help through various uh, other organizations. There are small business development centers, SBDC, Small Business Development Centers. There's a group called SCORE, the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And there's other things you might find through, it could be as simple as like your community college network. So make sure you understand your tax responsibilities when you go into business, meet those, keep good records, and hopefully you won't have too many negative interactions with us. So thank you again, Mr. Wozniak. We really appreciate you for coming on board. So that concludes our conversation regarding small business and also dealing with the gig workers and self-employed. Please stay tuned for the next uh, round, which will be next Tax Tuesday, and we will be focused. That will be our final session, and it will be about nonprofits. It will be about faith-based organizations anything with community-based organizations that have to file their income taxes or just work with the IRS, this will be your opportunity to bring your questions directly to the source. On behalf of Congresswoman Yvette Clark, we thank you for joining us at this time. Have a great day.